welcome to the next in our series of conversations with giants in medicine. I'm Ushma Neal from the Journal of Clinical Investigation and this is Howard Rockman, our Editor-in-Chief. Today we shift our format and allow three of our most charismatic giants to interview each other. Our Masters of Ceremony today is Dr. Robert Lefkowitz from Duke University. Dr. Lefkowitz is known for his seminal discoveries in understanding G-protein coupled receptor function. In a remarkable career, he has transformed the idea that drug receptors are specific molecular entities, delineated their invariant seven transmembrane domain structure, discovered the universal mechanism by which these receptors are regulated, and showed that the GRK beta arrestant system he originally discovered as a mechanism of signal dampening also plays a much broader role in receptor signaling. His work has created, empowered, and let, led to one of the largest and most central areas of biomedical research today. Also joining us are Joseph Goldstein and Michael Brown from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Their legendary partnership has spanned more than four decades, and together they were awarded the 1985 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, acknowledging their discovery of the LDL cholesterol receptor and its role in cholesterol metabolism. Their discoveries laid the groundwork for the development of statins, which block cholesterol synthesis, increase LDL receptors, and lower blood cholesterol, thereby preventing heart attacks. Statins are taken daily by more than 20 million people worldwide. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. We we'll look forward to learning more about the story of your careers. Thanks. I'm delighted to be here, uh, particularly so with uh, two very close friends, uh, colleagues whom I've known for many, many years, uh, two gentlemen who, will, <coughs> although they are my peers in terms of age, have always been scientific heroes of mine. Uh, so this is a real pleasure for me. Uh, the three of us have a lot in common. We're about the same age, almost 70 years old, hard to believe it. Uh, I guess in their case, already 70. I've got uh, just a little bit more to go. Uh, we all graduated medical school the same year, uh, followed similar career paths. But we started off somewhat differently. I grew up on the streets of New York City uh, in the Bronx uh, and uh, first developed an interest in becoming a physician when I was in the third grade, inspired by my uh, family physician uh, who just captivated me. Uh, and so that became my passion, my goal, to become a physician. Uh, I thought I might ask uh, Mike and Joe uh, how they started out and how they uh, were led to a career in medicine. Joe, in particular, you, you came from a very small town in South Carolina, very different from me in the Bronx and Mike, I think, in Brooklyn initially. Uh, so how did you get started? So, yeah, I was brought up in a town called King Street, South Carolina, and had about maybe three, 3,500 to 4,000 people. It was called King Street because during the Revolutionary War, uh, the king had planted a tree there and the <laughs> colonists cut it down. Okay. So that's why it's called King Street. But um, I always say it, uh, that um, there are three famous people from King Street, South Carolina, uh, Bernard Baruch and um, me and um, a movie star who nobody's ever heard of. Right. They were the, <laughs> right. the three famous people from King Street. So anyway... Uh, there is a sign, may I interject, I know, which has right. your name on it right. there. It says, <laughs> right. King Street, home of Joseph Goldstein, Nobel Laureate. Right. Actually, uh, Bob Weinberg, the famous cancer biologist, actually has, has relatives in South Carolina, and one that actually lived in... King Street, and he was driving through. That's, I didn't even know the sign was there, and he took a picture of it. <laughs> it so to me, I was really embarrassed and aghast. Right. <laughs> Nonetheless, but anyway, the town, I, I went to high school, had 60 students. In those days, uh, the, uh, the, there was complete segregation. It was an all-white high school. The, the county that I lived in was uh, half black and, and half white. And um, But I had really good teachers. I would say... Uh, I really, they focused on reading, writing, and arithmetic. And right. So, and I had a great chemistry teacher. And I guess that was the first, my first real interest in science was uh, chemistry in high school. Mm -hmm. Look, might tell you about a different. So we. Well, let me from first let me say one thing about King Street. <laughs> I, Joe's heard this before, but, <laughs> but I used to think King Street was in the middle of nowhere, and then I went to visit it, and I realized. The middle of nowhere is a defined place. It's the middle of nowhere. Right. King Street is off to the side <laughs> of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
it's really remarkable that Joe grew up there with it and became such a scholar. Um, I uh, was born in Brooklyn and, and um, my father, my motivation for medicine came from my father. The only one in his com community, he was a salesman. Mm -hmm. And he kept telling me from the time I could listen that um, the only person who doesn't have a boss is a doctor. He, in his community, um, the doctors were the highest, the most respected people, and they were all individual practitioners and none of them had a boss. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, if you want to grow up without a boss, be a doctor. So that was my initial motivation. And then in high school, um, I became, became um, an amateur radio operator. I had a friend who uh, introduced me to building um, usually kit uh, transmitters and receivers. And so um, going through, you know, putting together a kit and then you know, in the middle of the night plugging it in and uh, blowing every fuse in the house. <laughs> And then you had to go back and, and sort of retrace your steps and figure out where you went wrong and what was soldered in the wrong mm -hmm. way. Um, and that's basically what I've done ever since in the lab. You do it too, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so at the time you entered medical school, I and mean, when I entered medical school, I really had no serious intention of ever being a scientist. I mean, my goal was to be a physician, mm -hmm. just like the family physician who had inspired me. Uh, how about you? I mean, when you were in medical school, was it your thought you would become a biomedical scientist or that you would primarily be a physician? So, so they had, so I went to medical school at UT Southwestern and they had a, um, a program that was just beginning for research, you know, for medical students. Actually, it was run by uh, Gene Wilson, famous endocrinologist, uh, former editor of the JCI. Um, anyway, uh, I was assigned to work with um, uh, a scientist who was a specialist in liver disease, and his ex his expertise was on the BSP test. Remember the BSP test? Yes. Yeah, so oh my the, goodness. The yes. Bromosulfathaline. Right. Uh, for liver. The younger people may not remember right. this, but we all had to inject <laughs> BSP. Right. Uh, to assess liver function. Right. You, you gave it IV, and then you had to come back 45 minutes later and take a blood test. Mm -hmm to measure and you were looking to see whether the BSP was conjugated by glutathione in the liver. Right. And that's what you were measuring in the blood test, the percent conversion. So there was a complicated assay for, for BSP, uh, which was a thin layer aspect, assay to measure the difference in BSP in the conjugated form. And so to make a long story short, uh, I was making a standard curve of this BSP in a spectrophotometer and I this is not like my first month in the lab, had the wrong, wrong wavelength and I found something that that my professor that I work for, Burton Combs, uh, was looking over my shoulder and had never seen before because he never worked this way. I'm going to make a long story short, I figured out a way that one could easily measure the conversion of BSP to BSP glutathione in like one minute. Right. And so I wrote a couple of papers on this as a medical student. So that was really my first introduction to discovery, that I made a discovery, even though I may not have completely known how to interpret it at the right. time. I made the discovery myself that turned out. So you got that, so that high. Got that was the first time. Hooked on science. Right? Yeah. How about you? I and mean, when did you really? Well, I went back to some of my uh, papers. When I was in high school, um, I had sent out uh, sort of a little resume for people to write letters for my college applications. and I. I was amazed when I went back and looked because I had put career, uh, future career, and it said medical science. Like you, I, I wanted to be a physician. But back in those days in medical school um, at Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, the whole attitude was if, you know, if you're very good, you'll be a very good doctor. If you're really great, you'll be a professor. Right. And um, they prided themselves on how many professors they had trained. So, that was my initial motivation. And then it was at the NIH, where we all met, that I got my first sort of eureka moment. Um, I was working in the lab of Earl Statman, a great, great um, biochemist, enzymologist, and I made a chance observation, kind of like Joe's, but it, it um, turned the whole lab around and, and, and um, you know, I became the center of attention. Right. And, well, you know what that's like. You were exactly, I used to go to your news conference. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but it, it is interesting that you need somewhere early, you need yeah. that kind of a, the, a sense of, uh, wow, this is incredible. Right. Oh, that you can do something different that no one else is doing. Right. And I think that's really probably the key. That's the key. Right. And it really doesn't matter in retrospect how important the finding is, right? right? I mean, if, if you, you can give a student or a fellow if they can just have that eureka moment, no matter how trivial the finding is, right. and appreciate that in that moment they're knowing something right. that nobody else knows right. in, in that instance. In self-confidence. Yeah, exactly, and then you really get hooked. Right. Now, one of the most remarkable things about the two of you is, is your scientific partnership. Uh, this is unique uh, in our experience, and there are so few scientific partnerships. I remember giving a talk at a symposium held in your honor, which I believe was for the 25th right. anniversary of, of this remarkable ago, collaboration. Right, right. And I was thinking back and I said, is it possible that was almost 15 years yeah, ago? Really I mean, it was just right. absolutely amazing. So there are so, so, so few scientific partnerships. So I'm curious, how did this partnership get started and how in the world did it persist all these years? Well, we met at the MGH, uh, Mike and I were both uh, interns. He has a interesting story he'll tell about his perception. Right. But, uh, but, but I would say, um, I guess we were sort of in the emergency room, maybe the third month we were in the emergency room together. That's where we probably first got to know each other. And, and we really, those are the days when you're on every other night. Mm. And, you know, you really had to work hard. Night what we refer to as the days of the giants, yeah. right? <laughs> and, um, and so we would always talk about cases and somehow we uh, uh, had a mutual respect for each other and we were interested in, uh, both of us were interested in metabolism at the time and, um, you know, I remember very specifically we had a patient that came in with meningitis who had lipodystrophy. And, and that was sort of interesting. Neither one of us knew very much about lipodystrophy, so we taught each other about lipodystrophy. Mm. How about uh, how about you, Mike? What's your perception? Well, this? first of all, Joe said I'll tell the, uh, that I would tell a story, and I will. When I was accepted at the Mass General for an internship, it was the first I was the first person in eleven years that from Penn that mm -hmm. had been accepted because it was the most competitive. Correct. And I was, I was, you know, ecstatic. And then two weeks later, there were only like twelve interns. There were only yeah, twelve. Yeah, very competitive. Well, that was the Harvard. top internship right. to get. Right. Six from Harvard and six from uh, the rest of the world. Right. So, uh, um, so you know, I was so excited. And then a week later, they send you the list of your fellow interns, and there was this guy, Goldstein from Southwestern Medical College in Dallas, Texas. You know. Who, I never heard, I thought it was a Bible school. <laughs> and I figured, well, if they're accepting this guy, then maybe, you know, nobody applied this year. Right, that's why so they accepted hot, yeah. me and, and, you know, so I had very low expectations. And I remember it a little differently. At least I remember admiring Joe's uh, in intellect and, and experience very early. I mean, I, I put it within the first two or three days mm -hmm. of residency. It was clear that he knew more than anybody else not only in the internship group, but mm -hmm. the, more than most of the senior residents and half right. the faculty. So, um, but part of it was because of his training at Southwestern. Uh, the experience at Parkland, taking care of uh, patients in a county hospital, he had much, much more hands-on experience than mm -hmm. I did. Um, so, you know, it was clear that uh, this guy was going someplace right. and I just decided to ride along. I often like to tell the story uh, uh, about this partnership that there's a remarkable mind meld uh, between the two of you. So, as you know, we, we find ourselves together uh, at meetings, conferences, scientific advisory board meetings. Sometimes I'm with Joe, sometimes I'm with Mike, sometimes we're all together. But I have found, without exception, if I'm with Joe and I tell him something, I don't care how trivial it is, it could be a scientific fact, it could be a piece of scientific gossip, the next time I see Mike, he knows it. <laughs> okay, and this is without exception, and there aren't enough hours in the day for Joe to have related everything I told him to Mike, and yet, and vice versa. Yeah. So how does that work? Uh, Let me just say it again, it, it's not just gossip. I come in every morning, and Joe gives me a complete digest of the scientific literature from the night before, okay? I mean, I, 
It, I have the most privileged existence because I don't have to read anything. It's amazing. And everything in the New York Times. I, I have had the yeah. experience at, on many occasions of being with Joe at a, at a meeting and yeah. we, we come down like at 7 a.m. Right. Uh, to catch the bus to wherever we're going. And he says, have you seen this story? Have you seen that? I said, no, where did you read it? He says, in the Times. I said, how did you get the Times this early? He, but he just kind of smiles. He, and, he tries uh, to get it. Yeah. But you, you get off a plane with him, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm telling stories about Joe. But if you, get off, if, if, you get a, if you get off a plane with him and you're walking through the concourse and I'm worried about the taxi or picking up my luggage or whatever, he makes a beeline for the newsstand just in case there's something new out there mm -hmm. that you can read. And then the internet was invented for him. Oh, I mean, my there's God. no question that Al Gore invented the internet <laughs> for Joe Goldstein. It, it's just Joe's two the Southerners, you know, obviously. Joe is the ultimate multitasker. <laughs> I, I, I've had on many occasions uh, the following experience. We'll be sitting at a scientific advisory board meeting for a company and a very complicated uh, set of slides is being shown. I'm trying my best to focus all my attention on it. Joe's busy on the internet sitting next mm -hmm. to me. He's got his computer out or his iPad and he's, he's flicking back and forth between four stories and this and that. Uh, he's doing an email. And I say, he's not paying any attention at all. Uh, finally, they get to the end. He puts up his hand. He asks the most incisive question. I say, how is this possible? I mean, how can he operate on so many levels together? Kind of so, interesting. So I think all of us, the three of us are lucky that the internet wasn't invented, that Al Gore didn't come along <laughs> in our formative years because we would have never been able to focus. Because I think our, you've even given a talk on focus, focus, focus. Right. It probably is the most single important thing for a young scientist. Scientist is now. to focus. That's focus just... and really try to solve one problem at a time. You're right, Joe. I mean, this is a very interesting issue. If you, if you look at our three careers, one thing that we, we have in common is this element of focus. I often tell people mm -hmm. that uh, you could take most of the experiments going on in my laboratory right now, and if you went back to the experiment that led to that, and then the one that led to that, and the one that led to that, mm -hmm. you could go back to the day I opened my lab without mm -hmm. any oh, yeah. real jump. In other words, I've pursued a line of research. Right. It's ramified and you can't right. follow all the direction, right. but we haven't really jumped. I, th I right. think the same is sort of uh, true of yeah. your career. The way I say it is that we never jump with two feet. If we're, <laughs> if, if we always keep one foot on solid ground. If we're exploring new areas, we right. keep one foot on solid ground. So all of our work has really stemmed around cholesterol, lipids in general. Right. Um, and it's nice because, you know, a lot of smart people aren't interested in lipids, so we makes it easier for us. So I, I, I think an interesting question for, for any scientist uh, who's been uh, as successful as, as you guys have been is, is how you got to the particular problem which basically was the basis of your career. Uh, Joe, I know you had an interest early on in uh, uh, clinical lipid disorders from your fellowship. Mike, mm -hmm. you were studying the enzyme mm -hmm. HMG-CoA reductase, mm -hmm. which is the rate limiting step. Uh, so h how did you come to the actual problem that you wanted to study at the beginning, the regulation? Well, so remember when we went to the NIH, all three of us were clinical associates, even though we worked in labs. I worked in Marshall Nirenberg's lab and had the great fortune to, uh, to have lab mates like uh, Tom Kasky and Ed Skolnick, um, from whom I learned a, a great deal. We worked on... Uh, the end stages of protein synthesis. Anyway, while one worked in the lab, we also had to see patients. And one of the first patients that I saw in the Heart Institute were these, uh, the, this brother and sister, six and eight years old, that had what's called homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. They had cholesterols of 800 to 1,000 wow. milligrams per deciliter. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had coronary disease. One of them had already had a heart attack and the other had severe coronary disease. And so they were being brought into the NIH uh, under uh, Don Fredrickson's laboratory to, for study. And so I remember this was really the most unbelievable patient I had ever seen. I remember telling Mike and everybody else that right. that's all about this. He was the only one that responded in a <laughs> dramatic way. So we started talking about it. And I had, um, having come from Southwestern Medical School, uh, I knew uh, there was a scientist named Marvin Sipperstein who worked on cholesterol synthesis at 
HNG CoA reductase. And so one, I knew a little bit about that it was regulated in animals when you fed cholesterol or the enzyme went down and when you put them on a low cholesterol diet it went up. So Mike and I kept talking about this and we came up with this idea that uh, that the defect in this disease, these were homozygotes, so they had uh, two abnormal genes. And the heterozygous form of familial hypercholesterolemia is a very common genetic disease, one in 500 people. About 5% uh, of heart attacks under age 60 uh, occur in people who have heterozygous form that have cholesterols around. This three was years. a finding you made during your fellowship it's with Arnold Matulski. Right. But, uh, but anyway, back to, so we came up with this idea that, that maybe the, the most logical defect would be in this enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase, and, and you would have a mutation in the site that would respond to feedback inhibition by cholesterol. Allosterism was in the air then because of Jacoby right. Minot. So that was the most obvious mm -hmm. thing. So, so uh, Mike can take the story from there. So, w so where were you thinking at that well, point? That that the, 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 at what the locus were you thinking this defect might be? At the level of the enzyme. Yeah. And whereas everybody else was focused on, in fact, the Fredrickson lab, they were characterizing the lipoproteins in great detail. In other words, they would take out the LDL and then do that was when all the APL proteins were being defined mm -hmm. for the first time, and they were doing detailed hydrodynamic studies and physical studies and all that. And so Fredrickson had defined these different uh, subclasses? Yeah. Of and they, they were focused on uh, structural abnormalities in the APL proteins. Mm -hmm. That's what they thought gotcha. the defect was. Right. Well, let me just first start by saying a word about NIH, because it meant a lot to all three of us, right? right? And the fact is, um, it was magical. I feel really, really sorry for the current generation because they don't have the experience. So the three of us had the same background. We all right. were, went to medical school. We were all very serious about our clinical, being clinicians, learning to be mm -hmm. great doctors. And we go to NIH and suddenly we get thrust together with all these scientists, these incredible scientists. And, you know, there's a whole, the, if you look at the achievement of people just like us who went through the NIH at that time, it was remarkable. And I think it's because of the culture, because that you took this clinical group and you put them together with these brilliant scientists and suddenly, you know, it's this clash of different cultures that really put... I want to interject that in our group of, of clinical associates, which was right. quite small, in addition to the three of us, was Harold Varmus. Right. Okay. Uh, I believe at the NIH, at least overlapping with us, was, was Gilman, right? Gilman and also Farid Murad. Farid Murad. What about Stan, Stan Prusna? Uh, and, um, and then we mentioned Ed Skolnick. And it, right. Kasky. All of us were basically on about two floors. Right, exactly. It was, right. Quite, so it was quite remarkable. Amazing. And also, as you point out, I think it was, and none of us really had that much experience in That's science. correct. So right. we're all MDs with very little experience, and then there were these giants like Nirenberg and Amundsen and Statman and Pastan and Roth and Vir all these. Virtually, virtually the, almost the entirety of our generation right. of yeah. physicians who became uh, basic researchers right. uh, emanated from, from that. that institution at that time. We all met each other too. And we all met each other, right. It was not only meeting these basic scientists, but it was being funneled together. together. And, you know, like we shared clinical duties. The question is whether there's any way to recapture that. Well, I don't with know. that, you need a draft. You need, <laughs> yeah, right. You need so this is, this is interesting. So I, I, I hadn't realized that you guys were sort of uh, scheming together yeah. at the NIH right. about the HMG-CoA right. reductase and the regulation. Right. And then Joe goes off to study uh, clinical genetics right. with Arnold Matulski. Right. You stay on with right. Earl Statman. How did... And then I know Joe was going back because right. he had basically been, uh, you know, tapped or knighted it. by right. uh, Don Selden to right. come back there. Right. Ha what happened to well, you? Well, How did you wind up well, down there? Well, Joe kept telling me, you know, what a wonderful place Southwestern was. And I, and I met Selden, and he was just the most imposing person I'd ever met, right. just in terms of erudition, not, o not only in medicine and science, but every a other real subject. polymath, right. knew everything. And, and incredibly inspirational. So um, I decided to give Southwestern a try, even though I still thought it was a Bible school. And um, <laughs> the real problem was my wife. And I pay enormous, every chance I get, I, I pay her a tribute because she was 
died in the world. You know, I'm from Brooklyn, you're from the Bronx, right. she's from Queens. Okay? Oh, right. <laughs> we covered three of the five right. boroughs. But she was, I call her a born-again Yankee. And, right. and being, uh, going to uh, Dallas, Texas in 1971, just a few years after Kennedy's assassination, that was not high on her list, especially since our, my other opportunity was in San Francisco at UCSF. Right. But, um, uh, you know, sh she agreed to come. And, um, and I promised her it would be for one year. <laughs> right. That's 41 years ago. I want to interject that uh, Mike and his wife, Alice, who uh, have been together since, I guess, high school days. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's nice to see a marriage like that. Well, I, you know, I, t I tell people I found two people in my life that I can get along with. Right. One is Joe and right. the other is Alice. <laughs> right. And I, <laughs> I don't switch easily. Right. But um, anyway, to, to get along, make a long story yeah. short. So I started, so the uh, hypothesis was there was something wrong with an allosteric site on this enzyme. And since I had learned about enzymes with Earl Statman when I went to um, Dallas, I started working on HMG-CoA reductase, which was a very recalcitrant enzyme because it was a membrane bound that you've mm -hmm. dealt with <laughs> right, right. your whole life. Right. So you know what it's like. Uh, and it had never been solubilized, never purified, and I was very lucky that um, I was able to solubilize the enzyme and at least do a partial purification. Mm -hmm. Turned out, now that we know about it, it was, it was actually a proteolytic fragment of the enzyme that had lost its membrane attachment site, but it was soluble and it had the full activity. <laughs> so anyway, somehow I got, it, it was a big breakthrough and I got a lot of, again, a lot mm -hmm. of attention credit. Um, and so, um, but Joe, when he was in Seattle, learned about tissue culture. And so the idea was we would study the regulation of the enzyme in cultured fibroblasts from normal children and from these children with this rare homozygous. Remember, you couldn't culture epi. liver, and that was right. theoretical at the time. Well, it, yeah. In fact, the, Joe wrote a grant on this, and it was turned down because everybody said the only important mm -hmm. way to study cholesterol is in the liver, and these mm. guys want to study it in fibroblasts. I think for the Again, for the audience, the clinical audience, they should understand that even, both of us were still doing full clinical duties. We were doing uh, two months of general ward attending at uh, Parkland Hospital as, as attending physicians. Joe was running a genetics counseling clinic, and I was trained in gastroenterology. I was, I was, do, I was for two years, I, and I did all the endoscopy at Parkland <laughs> Hospital. Wow. So that was all going on while we started this collaboration mm -hmm. to study the regulation of cholesterol synthesis in fibroblasts. That well, was, attending was really actually fun. I sort of, those are the days when you really didn't have to write, you could only say patient seen and examined. I mean, I, I had the same experience. Because I was also I kind of anything. driven out by all the, you know, the requirements for daily oh. notes. But I was going to ask you, and we'll come back to the story in a minute. I mean, we all started out as physicians, and then we did basic research, and then for a while we did both. We were right. at the bench and we right. were in the clinic. Right. For years now, we haven't done either, right? <laughs> uh, we don't do any experiments. We don't go to the clinic. Do you miss it? And if so, what do you miss more uh, in terms of, do you, do you actually miss more being able to function as a sort of an attending physician, or do you miss more actually being at the bench working with your own hands? Well, uh, so I'm impatient, so I like right. to get answers. I would say that I'd love to be able to, to have this, the skills now that I used to have in the bench and right. go in and do the And do the key experiment, time, right. And I think Mike similar to because it, it really, you know, when you feel like this has to work. Right. I used to self-advertise in my lab with my fellows as my time at the bench, you got less and less and less because you had more and more right. people that you would right. direct. I used to claim that I, I could solve any problem with a 10-tube experiment. <laughs> I had need two additional for blanks, but with, with those <laughs> right. 10 tubes, I, I could test any hypothesis right. we could come up with. Right. Uh, so you guys came, who actually arrived at Dallas first, you or Joe? I, well, that, that's a very important point because uh, Joe was already famous in Dallas. Um, you know, they had, from his medical school from days. From his medical school days. In fact, they, the students had uh, demanded that they have a separate curve for Joe. Right. <laughs> all the other students. But um, I, w I was an unknown, and, and um, it, 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 uh, this part of the stability of our partnership 
uh, comes from the fact that I had this year uh, before he came back in which to kind of establish my own identity mm -hmm. um, at Southwestern. And as I say, I had, was lucky to solubilize this enzyme, which a great Nobel Prize winner named uh, Fyodor Lenin, who had discovered the enzyme, had said that um, it was a, a virtually, it was, that it was totally impossible to solve and that he had wasted dozens of fellow right. years and suddenly here I am, a novice. So I had gotten uh, some attention from that. And so when he came back, we were considered equals. And I think in terms of a stable partnership, the reason partnerships fall apart, the, well, the they time. always fall apart, is that um, one or the other is considered to be the dominant right. uh, person and then the other one feels exploited in some way. Sure. Uh, our medical school has never allowed that to happen. Mm -hmm. I give tremendous credit, first to Dr. Selden, and second to the administration of our school, because they never distinguish between the two of us. You know, in order to get promoted at Duke, mm -hmm. the tenure committee has to say, okay, what did this person do as an individual thing? How do I know that this person deserves tenure? They have to have done something, quote, independent. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, <laughs> we all sure. our papers. Right. And so the, our school accepted the idea that we would be a team. Right. And uh, so I don't think it could have happened at a lot of other places. So, you know, the two diseases along of partnerships that get them in trouble is, one is astigmatism, mm -hmm. when, when the big picture is out of focus. Right. And the other is egotitis. Absolutely. That's a, and, of course, we all have that with our, our young people. We train them, and especially vulnerable times when they're getting ready to leave, but they're still working with us. And our name on the paper right. contaminates it, in a sense. Right. They don't get credit for that. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's so go good. back to so let's go back to the fibroblasts. So yeah. So now you brought the tissue culture, you, you, right. right? So I learned from actually Stanley Gardner, who's a um, very outstanding biologist and geneticist at the University of Washington. Still, still have, as far as I know, still have the lab in his uh, mid '80s. Anyway, he let me uh, come into his lab and learn to do fibroblasts. Where in those days. There were only two or three people that had ever studied diseases in fibroblasts, and one was Elizabeth Newfeld of the NIH that right. did this famous mixing experiment, mm -hmm. mucopolysaccharidosis. Right. So it was not that big a thing. In that's interesting days. to hear because today it's so that's the fact, way it's done. I know, and so and so we got fibroblasts from uh, a patient with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, and uh, Mike and I began a ritual that we carried out, I'd say for at least, what would you say, 20 years, where we would meet uh, <laughs> yeah. every day and right. plan the experiments. an experiment. Right. And then in those days, because remember, we were both patients, all of our assays, the additions would be made in the morning, the cells would be harvested in six hours, right. and the assay would be done that same day, so we would know the results by the end of the day. <clears throat> so then, Boy, can I relate to that? And I so that's, that turned out to be a key. So anyway, the, the first experiment was comparing the, the HMG CoA reductase activity in those cells versus normal fibroblast uh, plus and minus LDL, and we got this really dramatic result uh, where there was like a hundredfold difference in the presence of LDL, the HMG CoA reductase as a reflection of cholesterol synthesis it was a hundredfold high in the so really you couldn't suppress right. this in the, uh, the FH patient. Right. And so, and then when you added LDL, nothing happened, whereas in the normal, when you removed LDL, it went up 100 yeah. and it came back down. Right. So Mike and I planned that experiment, and we had one technician, we had one tissue culture technician, and we had one technician who was doing HMG CoA reductase assays. That was our lab at the mm -hmm. time. And so Mike went off to uh, Atlantic City, and... Um, when the results to present came this. Out no, 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 not to present. Not even no, present, no, just no, to go no, to the meeting. Know it. No, no, the, the experiment was being done no, while I was gone. Is, so, so he was gone for, to present. We'd done something else about the regulation of the normal fibroblast. Mm -hmm. That was what he was presenting. So anyway, Susie Dana, the technician, uh, went in around 4 o'clock to see what the results are. And she said, well, it looked like the experiment worked, but she was sort of a... She was negative about everything, even though she was probably one of the best technicians we've ever had. And I looked at it, I couldn't believe it. I was jumping up and down. Right. He was not there to talk to her. I ran right. to Selden's <laughs> office, 
<laughs> to show Tom, the result. And then, actually, that night, I can re this is one of those things that you yeah. can remember. J. Willis Hurst. Yeah, the, the cardiologist, cardiologist, yeah. Song, Emory was a visiting professor mm -hmm. in Dallas, and so Selden had a dinner party for him. There were about six right. of them, and I was the youngest one invited. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'd left a message to Mike. Right. Remember, there were no cell phones or right. faxes or anything <laughs> right. like that at the, this crazy hotel you stayed at in Atlantic City. Right. I got to go to the Sea Breeze or something. Right, oh, the Sea Breeze, sure. Uh, to call me at Dr. Selden's. Right. House. Right. He had a really interesting result. So this was the Federation meeting. It wasn't the Young Turks, it was mm -hmm. the Federation meeting. And so um, I called uh, Dr. Selden's house, and Joe told me this news, and I was so excited. I remember running out on the boardwalk, and I ran into a group of my friends that I had known from NIH who were working <laughs> in, in, the lip, in lipids and cholesterol. And, I, and we went out for beers, and I, you know, I wanted to tell them, right. you know, how can you tell somebody it's only been done once? Maybe right. it's, like one, it's like one cell line. <laughs> right, exactly. And with one cell line, it's, maybe it's a right. hundredfold difference. Is still. So I'm sitting there, kind of bubbling over, but not able to say anything. That was that was probably the. You know, it's thing. interesting. I mean, uh, there is this social aspect to science. I mean. When you get a result that's yeah. exciting, the first thing you want to do right. is turn to somebody right, right, and right, tell right, them about right. it. I mean, I think for most of well, us, I think we, that should be a characterization of our 40 years. Right, you could at least tell each other. Right, and so Absolutely. we've never had we to tell break. anyone else right. at, in the whole 40 years. Yeah, so. We've never had a, p a press conference. Never, you know, never. I mean, we've shied away from any kind of. Well, yeah, this is this is an interesting point. Uh, you know, the the. Previous, the only previous uh, individual who's been in this uh, interview series is Harold Varmus, a good right. friend and, again, right. an exact contemporary of all of us. And uh, like the two of you, he won the Nobel Prize for his work, and relatively early on in his career, right. uh, as did you. And he spoke in that interview about the fact that winning the Nobel Prize changed his career in a dramatic way. He said, he described the fact that he had, was just beginning to go through what he describes himself as a midlife crisis. And he found that winning the prize gave him a certain uh, public face, so to speak. People were coming to him uh, for opinions on all manner of things right. because he now had this credential. Right. And he realized he could use the prize as a platform to something else. He wasn't quite sure what. And uh, I've heard similar things from other laureates. Peter Agre, for example, spent several years at Duke right. Uh, right after he won the prize. And he was in this phase of trying to figure out what am I going to do with the prize? What is that going to lift me to do? And I've known others like that. On the other hand, there are laureates like yourself uh, where it's not clear to me the prize did much. You just went on your way, kind of, if I try to picture your careers, Without the prize, I mean, I think you'd pretty much be doing what you're doing today. <laughs> I mean, true. you seemed uh, to sort of shake it off pretty well. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Well, it definitely helped us in a funding sense. Actually, we got a lot of support from the Perot Foundation. So it's right. a great story. The, the president of our medical school, uh, before we won the prize, went to Ross Perot, who at that time was the wealthiest person in Texas, about funds for the medical school. You say at that time, the that two of you have currently having taken over that, uh, <laughs> that position. Right, that's 1983. Right, okay. Right. okay. So uh, anyway, uh, and Ross Perot said, well, I've never read about this medical school on the front page of the New York Times. That's my criteria, for, would be my criteria for giving money. And so the day we won the Nobel Prize, the next day was we were on the front page, actually. You've both been remarkable. Uh, public citizens, it seems to me, in terms of giving of your time to educational enterprises, scientific advisory boards, uh, really giving back to the scientific community. But like myself, neither of you has taken on leadership of a huge right. institution, although I would point out that uh, it's well known the extraordinary impact you've had on your own institution right. uh, in, in building it and helping with recruiting and directing right. things. Uh, but what about this, what must have been a conscious decision not to sort of, shall we say, seek the limelight or direct some large enterprise? It, well, first of all, it was a conscious decision. I think, again, it, you're helped a lot by having a partnership because we discussed this quite a bit. I'll bet. And what we realized was the same thing you, you know, if <laughs> circumstances had been reversed and you had been in that position, yeah. I think you would have done exactly the same thing. I know you would have. Right. The fact is, um, 
the, um, you know, what, what we asked ourselves, what, what is it that we really like to do? And mm -hmm. by that point, of course, we weren't working in the lab anymore, but our great thrill is to come in in the morning and have some excited graduate student or postdoc come up and with a hot experiment, you know, anxious to show us. And then, you know, or, you know, it even, it's even fun when the experiment doesn't work and you help them, you know, try right. to figure out. Well, that's, that's most of the time. Try to figure out. So, you know, that's what we really love to do. And so, why should this make any difference? And right. So, that, you know, and we were young. I yeah. was 41 years old. So, um, you know, it w but, but it helped that there were two of us. It right. helps not to get, get your head turned. Because, you know, I think what Harold was referring to is, yeah, you do have a bully pulpit. Right. And, uh, but um, we've tried to channel that um, to things, as you say, that, that would help the community. The other thing, too, is you have to think about in, in thinking about heading organizations that we've been asked to do, do you really want to spend all your time going to meetings all day? Right. If you look at what presidents of, mm -hmm. That's right. of these prestigious mm -hmm. places do, it's one meeting after the other. Right. I think and, and that's really what a day is like, to really be an effective. Right. I, I think the three of us, you, when you talked about that impatience to, to see the result at the end of the day, I mean, that's sort of like uh, uh, almost an addiction. And once you get that, I think the three of us have just never been able to get out from But it's changed, though. It's <laughs> right. It's yeah. certainly changed, don't you? It, the sure. molecular biology has changed in a major way because you can't get a result. Right. Often. Th this well, is correct. Well, you know. In uh, most cases. Well, you don't use the same assay. I, I mean, know. you know, how many thousand binding assays right. can you do? Right. I remember vividly, just similar, at the same time that you were uh, doing those fibroblast experiments, uh, myself and a, a young graduate student at MDP used to make PhD in my lab, Rusty Williams, whom you, whom you know, yeah. no, we were doing all kinds of experiments with the uh, receptors that we were studying. And I think back fondly on those days because we could do an experiment during the day, then we would go to the scintillation counter right. about six, seven right. o'clock before yeah. we went home, and we would get .1 minute counts just right. to sort of right. see right. what right. happened. Right. Yeah. Remember right. that? Yeah. In fact, sure. we wore right. out right. the dial on the <laughs> scintillation counter, you know, because you could run all right. through, and you know, right. you would, either counts went up, counts yeah. went down. You you would know what happened, right. and then you'd set it to ten minute right. counts and go home. But you went home with a sense of what happened that day. You know, uh, it's interesting. We, you know, of course, we shared that experience with each other. We didn't have any students. Right. We didn't have any postdocs for the first five or six years that we were working. We had these two technicians, but um, so we shared that electric experience of, right. of getting a, an important result. But it's interesting that I had no idea what a graduate student was. I remember when I was in <laughs> medical school working in a lab, and there were these guys that happened to hang around, and I knew they weren't medical students. Right. <laughs> I had no idea right. who they were. Right. I swear to God, I had no idea who they were. And, uh, and suddenly, you know, we have an MD, PhD program right. we're getting graduate. I think the best thing that I can say about mentoring is that you have to, if you're a good role model yourself, that's the best way without having a prescription. I like that's that. That's what I would say, just being right. what you do. In other words, if you come across as someone who is passionate about your work, curious, dedicated, Honest, honest, and, cr honest right. and critical. Is critical, really well, right. Self criticism. That's in fact. That's one. I'd say that's another name that Mike and I have. Is that we can have what's a good word for it? More than just self criticism, we can have dual criticism. Yes, I've observed that on many occasions. No, because uh. we can. We, you know, the good ideas come survive when both of us agree. Right. Well, I, I went, so, Joe once told me something which I've passed along to some of my people on a number of occasions, but I'm paraphrasing, but as I recall it, Joe once told me that the key to having one good idea is to have a hundred bad ones and very quickly sort through them to find mm -hmm. that one gem. Of course, I guess having the two of you... Oh, the partnership does Yeah, the partnership automatic, really helps with that, yeah, doesn't automatically. it? Automatically. But I always tell our students, almost sort of half-jokingly, that 95% of the literature is wrong right. and the other 5% oh, right. was written by us. <laughs> right. <laughs> I like it. So. Uh, this, this seems uh, akin to something I, I often tell my people, that there are th only three ways that people quote us, uh, insufficiently, inappropriately, or not at all. Uh, and uh, at, at some level, I, uh, I, I, I kind of believe that. But I very much endorse what you say about mentoring. 
Uh, not that long ago, uh, I saw a, a thick volume about this thick, which uh-huh. had been produced, and it was about how to be a mentor. Kind of from the National Academy. Yeah, from, how to be a mentor. And I was saying to myself, I never thought about that. I mean, the way to be a mentor is to put yourself out there. I try to make myself as transparent as possible. Anything that's going on, watch me. It's an apprenticeship, right? It's it's like in the old days, becoming a physician. You apprentice yourself and you watch. And you can't just watch for a month or two. You have to watch for several years. But I'm afraid that some of these summer rotations that students do are actually counterproductive. I couldn't agree more. Because... You know, it takes, it takes time know, to really right, get a sense of right. it. And, uh, you know, in terms of mentoring, I think, as you say, more than anything else, it's a matter of acquiring a certain sense of taste, of integrity. How do you do things? I guess one of the most challenging things that w- we have to do is, as you said, on the one hand, you need to demonstrate rigor. On the other hand, you need to demonstrate Great. even N equals one uh, right, can really right. turn you on because right. it gets you thinking. Well, right. we always... Yeah, and I always make that point. Often the, the fellows I find are resistant to show me. They'll, they'll, I'll say, you got something. Say, let, me, let me repeat first. I said, Don't repeat it first. I want to know now. Okay? We were just talking about that yesterday. Okay? And, you know, nine times out of ten, it either doesn't repeat or it's wrong. But still, you want to know the N equals one. I, like I hate it when they don't show us negative data. You're right. You would be say, great. Let's, let us see the negative data. Yeah. You should come. Be, yeah. We should... Hire you as a postdoctoral fellow. You could then be the model for our postdoctoral fellow. <laughs> I would love it. Uh, well, no, we're all the no, same. No, that is true. So right. We, well, I think we all have these very similar experiences. Right. Well, apparently we have to wrap up. I, I want to conclude with, uh, with one last story, which I think illustrates a little bit about these two guys. So it is remarkable, uh, I think, to many of us just how, uh, as I say, they kind of shook off r- winning the Nobel Prize and went on their way. But you shouldn't be fooled into thinking that these two are not rock stars of science and celebrities. I want to tell one brief vignette. Uh, so Joe and I were once flying from Dallas to San Francisco, something that we've done on many occasions, and uh, we are on several boards together. And on this particular occasion, this was a number of years ago, Joe, we sat together. Uh, and uh, about halfway through the flight, a gentleman was coming back, I guess, from the restroom, and he recognizes Joe. And he says, oh my goodness, he says, you're Joe Goldstein, that famous doctor who won the Nobel Prize. I read about you in the paper all the time. I'm so excited about what you do. And on and on and on. He, Joe just wanted to go under the chair. Yeah, I mean, you just could see the discomfiture. But these guys are really celebrities. So I would sort of end on that note that uh, although they, they wear this mantle uh, with a great deal of grace, uh, they still are recognized both amongst the scientific community uh, and the lay community for everything they've done. So one, so since you told that story, so yeah. people do, it, it's not as common as it used to be in Dallas, they would always see me or Mike or both of us and say, oh, you're the guy who won the Peace Prize. <laughs> you explain, no, we did this and other. Now we just say, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my well, goodness. I'll just end with one vignette about yeah. partnerships. Very frequently, people will call me Joe, okay. and, and I, you know, <laughs> And I always say, and they're always embarrassed, and I say, don't, don't be embarrassed. My wife makes the same mistake. <laughs> I love it.